Good morning, Hillside. How's everybody doing this morning? So, you know, you guys are the ones that won the lottery this morning. You actually made it to church on time. And I remember, you know, we've got automated clocks now. I remember a time I used to be in the nursery and I'd see all these cars pull up an hour late and <laughs> the faces that they made. Oh, well, let's see. Fanna, can I have my clicker? You got it. You got it. <coughs> Did you skip or is that the first one? Yeah, that's first okay, one. so the first one is Hillside Kids, and we have the opportunity to open up another classroom. I don't know if you guys realize this or not, but our preschool age is our largest age, so we are in need of going ahead and open up another classroom. So I'm excited about that, and I know the kids would be. Can I come back and talk about Hillside Kids here in a minute? So we have our reading plan, guys. Is everybody pretty good with the reading plan? We are doing Genesis 20 through 24 this week. So uh, Brandon, just a heads up. It's another one of those. I don't want you to blush like you did last week. <laughs> Things are going to be happening. So in case you guys didn't know, the kids, I try to keep them in with our scripture readings. So last week, their lesson was Noah. Um, their verse this month is, I have set a rainbow in the clouds, and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. So kids, tell them, what did we have for snack last week? What did we construct? What was it? And what did we make? We made a rainbow, and we put it in the clouds. So they got to taste a rainbow. They got to touch a rainbow. They got to smell a rainbow. Yeah. 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 So, um, so they also did babble. And, you know, Mr. Bruce and I did the younger kids last week, and all of a sudden he interrupted me, and I couldn't make out a word he said. Lucy, what was he doing? Do you remember? Where's Robbie? Robbie, what did Mr. Bruce say last week that we couldn't understand? Uh huh. He was babbling, wasn't he? Yeah. So uh, we're adding to our vocabulary too. Also, you know, we do Psalms 119 uh, with you guys. David, uh, you know, he was a man after God's own heart. And when you listen to the scriptures, he's saying in 119 how very important it is that we obey God's commands and that we get them in our heart. And in Deuteronomy, it also tells us that says as family as parents in our home that we should talk about scripture from the moment we get up until the moment we go to bed that's how we pour into our kids and that's how we pour into the next generation and that is so so very important in this day and age very important if we don't do it and every single one of you in this room is responsible for pouring into the kids if we don't do it they're not going to have it and you see the situation that our world is in now. And it is up to us to be different ma difference makers. Um, before I go on, because I will keep going on and not give you... <laughs> I will tell you that giving, you have both sides where you can give. You can go to hillsidechurchtennessee.org and give there. And... Giving is not just monetary. Giving is time. Giving is volunteering. Giving is getting involved. And guys, you have a great opportunity to do that and be hands and feet. And you can't give out give God. There's just no way. The more you give him, the more he's going to give you. And the one thing he's given you is talents and gifts all for his glory, to show his glory. And what he has created in you and what he has created you to be, he has installed that in you. And you have, if you don't use it, what a shame it is to have that gift and not glorify God with it. So 
I'm going to pray and get us going this morning. So if you'll all bow your heads. Father God, we just love you. We love you, and we love that you love us so much. You gave us so many gifts and talents, and I just pray, Lord, that each of us discover that within us. Lord, I I pray over those special moments where they hear you say, this is what I created you for. These moments, and they realize, and we all realize just how beautiful that is and how beautiful this relationship with you is each and every day and that it grows stronger and stronger. Lord, I pray over this congregation. I pray over Dave. I pray over everyone ministering ministering today that all we have to do is open our mouths and it's your words speaking to our hearts that pour out. Lord, I pray that the kids that they connect their hearts and their minds today with their lessons, that their world opens up to a far greater understanding than we did when we were their age, Lord. Lord, we just pray that all you have for them comes to life right in front of their faces, that it's not a story in a book, and it's not something that happens somewhere far, far away, Lord. It is your word, it is our lives, and it is for us, and we claim that, Father God. We love you so much, and we thank you for all that you have provided us for. We thank you that you created us to live right here, right now, and you gave us purpose, Father God, and you gave our children purpose. And I pray, Lord, that, that we pour into them. And for everything that everyone pours out, I pray that you just multiply that back to them, Father God. Lord, we love you and we give you all the glory. It's in your son's precious name that we pray. Thank you, Jesus. And amen. If you'll stand with us, <clears throat> we're going to read our verse together and we're going to enter a time of worship. Psalms 103 through 4 says this, know, know that, that the Lord, Lord he is God. God. It is he, he who made, made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. Amen. Brothers, sisters, come on down to that river. Guaranteed you'll never be the same. There's a fountain flowing from the heart of the Savior. Bring your sins and all your guilty stains. Let that river of life wash it all away. If you've been searching, carrying burdens, if you've been lost and looking for a home, if you've been drifting and something is missing, you should know. Come on down to that river, carry 
guaranteed you'll never be the same. Brothers, sisters, come on down to that river. Guaranteed you'll never be the same. There's a fountain flowing from the heart of the Savior. Bring your sins and all your guilty stains. By the blood of Jesus, everything will change. the time change has got everybody dragging. We had to start with something big to wake you up.
Thank you so much that your mercy is more, that you cast our sins as far as the east is from the west, and we are so thankful that you so freely forgive us if we ask. We thank you so much for just the opportunity to just come into your house to sing praises to you, 
and to make much of you, Father God. Thank you so much for just, just the freedom that we have to worship you, Father. And we just pray that we honor you each and every day of our lives, every day that you give us breath, that we praise your name and we bring honor to you. I pray, Father, as David opens the word, that we are attentive with our hearts and our ears and we we hear what you have for us today, Father God. Convict us. If there's something in our life that is keeping us from you, Father God, that is keeping us from being obedient to you, Father, just help us to just repent and turn from that, Father. Forgive us when we do fail you. Help us to be strengthened today by your word, Father, so that we can bring that light and your truth into our community, into our sphere of influence, Father. Pray that you just bless this time together. Thank you for everyone here and just pray that you just pour out a special blessing on them today, Father. We ask all these things in your son's holy and precious name. In Jesus' name, amen. My heart is set on keeping your decrees to the very end.
Good morning, church. So uh, two things real quick. One, um, Friday, if you were here Friday, I mean, it was probably um, probably one of the best worship gatherings and prayer gatherings that I personally have had uh, been a part of. It, it was beautiful. And when we do this again in September and October, I encourage you to be a part, man. I, I walked away from Friday just like, man, what, what a picture of what it's like to have a community that loves God loves each other, share scripture, sharing their testimonies, and um, uh, I never wanted Friday to be about one person speaking and a worship band, and I think the whole community participated in what Friday was, and, and I believe God was there. And, and, and secondly is this, just as a, a note, next week the prayer group is going to be meeting off campus, and, and I, want, I want to make this more known for you guys is often what happens with our prayer team, if somebody's sick and they really need prayer or if they're going through something very difficult and you need the prayer team to come to your house, which sounds frightening, right? But they don't bite. They don't bite, I promise. Uh, and I'm usually there too. Um, but um, we're, we're going we're gonna to be off a campus on Tuesday. We're actually uh, uh, going to pray at a house on Tuesday. So... Um, so don't come here on Tuesday unless you want to pray by yourself outside. Um, <laughs> but uh, just just know that, also know that this is available uh, to anyone in the church. Man, if you, you need someone just to show up at your house and pray, uh, we'll do it. And, and it matters to us that we are a praying church. All right, so if you have your Bibles, go to Psalms 119. And as you're turning there, we're going to be in verse. We're going to start in verse 41. Uh, um, there is a word that reveals ultimately of something good, but reminds us of the presence of difficulty or evil. And I think this is a word people need to revisit for a number of reasons. For the Christian who believes life is always good, that paths are always paved, directions are always clear, and ways are always made. They miss the reality of this word. Conversely, if a person believes that life is always bad, that doors never open, that sadness never leaves, that life will never change, they all miss the reality reality of this word that I want to dwell on today as we we go through these next two letters in, in the Hebrew alphabet. And this word, this word is deliverance. This idea of deliverance, it's both good and bad, right, when you think about it. It's the understanding that this word deliverance, that there is a difficulty before us, and there's a difficulty even in us if we are willing to see it. Deliverance means we need help. It means we can't save ourselves. It means we can't do this on our own. When you say the Lord's Prayer, for example, you say this. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. There is a role that God plays in who we are becoming. You are not a you are not a Christian in a vacuum. God is working in you and me if you are following Christ. And we pray this prayer because we need God to move on our behalf. We will not deliver ourselves. And there, there is a deeper message here on deliverance as well. If you thought your life was okay when you came to Jesus, you were delivered then, of course, but you're still being delivered. Listen to what Jesus says. He says this in Luke 4, and he's actually quoting Isaiah here. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and, and and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. This is a deliverance. This is something that God does. Now, in Isaiah's case, this was originally God's chosen people. What what Jesus is saying, this applies to believers as well. And not only that, they were already God's elect in the Old Testament, but there's still more for them to face and more for them to be delivered from. The gospel itself is deliverance. 
It releases the captives. It brings sight to the blind. It frees the oppressed. In the 1828 Noah Webster's Dictionary, the, meaning of, the meanings of deliverance are found in this, uh, the captive being set free, a release from slavery, a release from oppression, the idea of rescue, the acquittal of a prisoner. And I love that picture of what it's like to be captive. I mean, I don't like the idea of it, don't get me wrong. Nobody wants to be captive. But we are hopeless until we're delivered. It is a picture of what the gospel is for. If you are now saved, you were once lost. You were trapped in your own ways and your own sins. You were hopelessly separated from God, just like the rest of, the rest of us. And God is our greatest need. And he did something for you and me that we could never do for ourselves. Jesus dies for us, and in his death and resurrection, he delivers us. And this may sound foundational to some of you, but I want you to understand why am I talking about this? One, I think we should talk about it, but secondly is this. How we treat our deliverance is going to determine the type of Christian faith that we have. Many Christians live like Jesus did them a favor rather than save their life. You understand what I'm saying? Ah, you know, I'm going to read today. I might pray. Man, I might go to church. I might call a, a, a fellow believer and talk to them. It doesn't seem like a big deal. We, ask, we act like he did us a favor rather than the fact that he saved our lives. We may comprehend deliverance, but sometimes we don't live like we truly grasp what's been done for us. We don't live like this great thing has taken place, understanding we were once walking towards devastation. But thanks be to God and to Christ and to Him alone, we are now walking a much better road with a much better outcome if we are following Him. Even if your life is difficult right now, you're still walking a much better road. Thanks to Jesus, not you, not me, not your Christian friends, your pastors or your leaders. The whole purpose of us gathering together is that we're all just here telling you what he's done for all of us who believe. Imagine being in a dangerous situation and someone saves your life. And what if you look at that person and went, meh, thanks. Right? Right? We must see that we were hopelessly lost, desperate in need. And Christ met that need in our lives when he took the nails in our place because of his desire to glorify God. And in that glory, he rescued you and me. Sometimes what happens is, is we come to Jesus and maybe not a lot of bad things are happening in our life or horrible things. I had to hit rock bottom. I'm, uh, it takes Someone has to hit me across the side of the head to get a point across. I don't know about you, but some people come to Jesus and life's not that bad, and they go, yeah, I was saved. It's not the point of, of, of our condition. The point of our condition is that without Christ, we were lost, utterly and completely, hopelessly lost. Even if you grew up in the Bible Belt and had all the information, he didn't just do us a little favor. He saved us. When we were hopelessly lost, hopelessly not enough, in him we were found. He stood in our place because he is the only one who is enough. And we were saved from this horrible fate. We were delivered and we should every day sing a hallelujah for the fact that that's happened. No matter how difficult your life is, this realization should change what matters to us, where we spend our time, what we do with our efforts. And here's the key ethic that comes from understanding deliverance. Not just comprehending it, believing it. That sometimes it takes remembering what it was like being lost to realize the value of being found. And, it's, and it, sometimes it takes 
describing to ourselves what was it like hopelessly lost. Even if my exterior life was great, what did it mean to be apart from Christ? Even if you grew up in Sunday school and didn't follow him when you were, when you were adults, what was it like being lost? Because if I understand that, I see the value of deliverance. I see the value of being found. And for those in Christ, we cherish that we have been delivered. But in deliverance, it's not a one-time event. Our salvation is established, but we will continually be delivered throughout our lives as we face difficulty and opposition. You don't face those things alone. God is with you. Even if that deliverance were to come when you see Jesus face to face, maybe it doesn't even come until after you perish. You, when you perish, you're not lost. You're still found in Christ. And we have to understand this. And David, although he is God's instrument, he is delivered through every season of opposition. And today we still need God's hand in our lives. And if we approached our faith with that kind of urgency, we would live differently, myself included. We would live with a deeper desire to bring glory to the one who saved us. We should be mature in prayer because there will always be a need to be delivered. There will always be a need to pray. We should mature in faith because prayers are answered. We should live with an, an extreme gratitude towards God with the realization of all that he's done for us. And, and these are, are some of the signs of a maturing believer. That maturity happens and you, God walks with us and we recognize his presence in the midst of our trials, in the midst of our problems, even in the midst of our healing. So in our reading today, there are places where David sets his confidence upon God, despite David's difficulties and challenges. And I believe it's a lesson for all of us. So I realize my Greek pronunciations are bad, but I looked this one up. I, I will get correction later. But if you, it's either it's a wa sound or a va sound. Um, depending upon where you look at historically in the language. Now, the next one I'm going to slaughter. Just going to throw that right out there. Um, but if you have your Bibles, uh, we're going to go from verses 41 to 48. And look, guys, if, if you fall asleep a little bit, I get it. The hours change. I have the most impossible task today to try to keep you awake. But it is okay. I promise I'm going to do my best. Verse 41. Let your steadfast love come to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your promise. Then shall I have an answer for him who taunts me, for I trust in your word. And take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for my hope is in your rules. I will keep your law continually forever and ever, and I shall walk in a wide place, for I have sought your precepts. I will also speak of your testimonies before kings and shall not be put to shame. For I find my delight in your commandments, which I love. I will lift up my hands towards your commandments, which I love, and I will meditate on your statutes. So we get our first glimpse of deliverance in verse 41. David recognizes his flaws without God's salvation. And we as individuals by large, we're inconsistent. We sin. We don't even live up to our own standards. We have a person that we would love to be that we're not. We even have standards we don't live up to. So we understand our inconsistencies. Someone critical could easily find something to criticize in us. And I'll tell you lately, uh, man, I have unfollowed like just a number of groups online that, that I used to follow that choose criticism as their first response to things. There comes a place where we must defend the truth, but we do this in love, not mockery. And if we live with the expectation that if people don't believe the way we do, that they are wrong and we are right, 
we can become the very mockers David is facing here. And look, we can use our Christianity to criticize other people. We can do it. There is a place where you should stand for your beliefs. But even Jesus, if you look in the, new, in the Gospels, he has his most heated discussions with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the re- religious leaders. At the end, what happens? Near the end, he weeps over them. He weeps over them. There is a heart for them. He says, how I long to gather your children to get together as a hen gathers. So from the perspective of the mocker in this passage, we are not to criticize before we first love. That is the perspective of Jesus. To those who rejected him, to that extreme, he chooses love, but he stands up for the truth. Yet neither are we to remain silent when the truth is challenged. All is done in love. And and this is so important for us. Christian theology was never meant to be a tool to make mockers out of us. Theology was always man's attempt to understand the Bible. And while the Bible is flawless, theology will always be flawed by man's reasoning. Theology is our attempt to understand the Bible. I don't know if you know this, but every person in this room here is a theologian. Whether you know it or not, you go, Dave, I am no theologian. What the heck are you talking about? Every one of us reads scripture and and we translate to our hearts and minds our understanding of what we think that means. The minute you do that, you're a theologian. The minute you try to understand scripture, you're a theologian. You will create a theology within you, good or bad. And sometimes we try to inject our own opinions on Scripture. Then our theology starts to get flawed. But make no mistake. You are forming a theology of belief every day you live. I believe this. I don't believe this. And we have to to understand by what criteria are we determining theology. And, And so with all of that, we can either be the mocker Or we can understand that people are a work in progress. We should be humbled by what has been revealed to us by God and his word. Not arrogant. So from the perspective of David, we talked about the mocker. Now let's talk about David. From the perspective of David, the grace and mercy of God absolves David of his inconsistencies and his sins. He understands that he's a sinner. He understands that he's a work in progress. And while people may mock us for our humanity, or, but our ultimate judge, God himself, will deliver us. And in a New Testament sense, he'll deliver us because of his son. So like David, we merely live with our hearts and lives set upon him, and he will deliver us. David's enemies wanted David to fall, but David's life was, and even now still is, in God's hands. And the same holds true for all who put their trust in him. So we have to look at Psalms 119 from a Christian perspective. Uh, From the old covenant point of view, David and faithful Jewish people trusted in the law of God. But in the New Testament, from our perspective of Jesus, we understand that the law showed us who the Messiah would be. When you look at all the laws in the Old Testament that David and all of Israel followed, what we understand in the New Testament is that every one of those laws said that there's going to be a person who does all of these things. And by the end of the Old Testament, we understand that that person is going to be the Messiah. So when we look at the law now, what we understand is when David follows the rules of the law, we're following the one who completed it. And and we are following Christ. So from our perspective of Jesus, we understand that the law showed us who would be the Messiah. So what is clear in the New Testament writings is that there would be only one. Only one who kept the law perfectly. And that would be Christ. And, and And with that, as the Old Testament writers profess to follow the law, The Christian follows the the one to whom the law reveals. 
Jesus Messiah. So when we read this, we have to look at this with New Testament eyes. In verse 43, David says, My hope is in your rules. As a believer, our hope is in the one of whom the rules point to. So understand that as we read this psalm. So when we read of the law, even today, there is a standard to live by. I don't know if you know this, but all the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament are repeated in the New Testament. The Ten Commandments are, 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 are actually repeated there. And, and what I would tell you this, is this, is that Jesus comes and he offers us mercy and grace, but he still leaves us a standard to live by. He doesn't do away with the law. The law did not go away, and Jesus said it wouldn't go away. So in the New Testament, we no longer follow the commandments as a means to be saved. We follow the commandments as an expression of love to Christ. And it is by Christ that we are saved. And in loving God and our neighbor, we fulfill the law through Christ. And there is a need within us to not only study the truth, but to understand it, not even just to memorize it, but to walk in it. And we're going to see this throughout Psalms 119, that there is a truth to walk in. There is an understanding that truth is a daily need because God is a daily need for us, all of us. And, And there is no truth without God. So for the Christian, Christ is the one upon our hearts and pouring out the praise from our lips. The Holy Spirit continues to do a work in us, and we we learn from His teaching. And there is a heart check that we should do regularly in the Christian walk. I want to give you a heart check right now, and I want you to be honest with yourself. Be honest. What is God working on in your heart and life right now? See, um, back in the day, um, I, I learned this, and I had, uh, I had a desire to, to communicate this truth, and, and especially with people who were going through things. And so when I would do counseling, I would ask this question. And most of the time when I asked this question, I didn't get an answer. It was, it was a blank stare. And it was a thought. It was just a moment of somebody just kind of digging in their mind. Could you give me an answer? The point is this. We should be able to communicate God's activity in our hearts at this moment. And this should happen on a regular basis. You should be able to respond. In prayer, he, he, he's, maybe he's led me here. And reading scripture, I was reading the word, and this is where he showed me and convicted me. And this is, this is something, this verse, when I read this passage, I felt something upon my heart and life that said, Dave, you need to start doing this. You need to stop doing these things. How often do we try to answer this question? And it's so important He's showing me this. And those around me, these are are my burdens for the people that I love and I pray for them. And he's given me that burden. How well do you answer this question? God's changing me this way, continually. Here's the hard part, right? Here's the danger that I want to warn you of. If we no longer believe we are hearing from God regarding our walk with Him, maybe we've quit listening. Maybe we've quit listening. And it's a frightful place. And most people don't think about it this way. It's not that you're always going to hear this audible voice telling you where to go, who to talk to, or what to change. But by His Word, by the Spirit convicting you in your prayers, by those around you who love you and observe you, that God uses them in in your life. You come to these convicting and challenging moments where God is shaping you towards his purposes and for his glory. But if it's been a while since you stopped and said, 
God, where would you have me go? God, what would you have me do? God, open my heart as I open your word. Show me what to change. Show me what to stop. Show me what to start. If it's been a while since you've done these things or, or have been prompted in this way, maybe you're not listening to your Lord. And I have to check myself. I have to check myself. I can read the Bible all day long and miss this. I can. And quite honestly, I have. Man, if it's been a while, my humble advice is to stop, to pray, to repent, to move forward. Be directed by God. So then in verse 45, we see the outcome of this deliverance. David says he walks in a wide place, if you have the ESV, is what it says. He walks in a wide place. This would be the antithesis of prison. Prison is confined in a small, shallow place. But David is free. And he's freely walking in in wide places. And the final outcome of God's deliverance of those who are his is everlasting liberty. Those outside the Christian faith at best see Christianity as some unnecessary rule and lifestyle system. But the Christian clearly sees the freedom that comes with following Christ. And this kind of freedom does something to us and in us. And when we get a taste of it, we want more. Many of you know what I'm talking about in this. Life changes when all of our thoughts, our motives, our desires, and affections are unified in exalting Christ. And this unity, when it happens, it changes our speech. It changes our actions. It changes our direction in life. Because we're living for a very different reason. And and I believe this takes time to understand and to even implement. Our thoughts scatter. Our motives get diluted. Sometimes we don't listen when we pray. Our desires sometimes cloud our faith, which impacts our affections. We can be divided Christians. Part of me is here and part of me is over here. But when these fall into place within a person, when this happens, you are a force to be reckoned with for the kingdom of God. You are ready and willing to give a testimony to anyone, even kings, as mentioned in this passage. Not even due to some obligation to God. You are so deeply changed. You say, God is, let me tell you what God has done. He's changed my life. It's changed everything. I need to tell you what's happened. I couldn't live any other way and nor do I want to. So let me tell you what God has done for me. It is testimonies like that that impact the lives of the people around you. So the word repeated in verses 47 and 48, this word is love. Saints. My prayer is that we would be so affected by the cross that we chase after the God who has done all of this for us and we recognize his love. And may we seek a greater mark upon our hearts of Christ's restoration expressed in grateful obedience and our soul's delight. I believe this. For those who see clearly the the tremendous cost of redeeming love. These are the ones who life is marked by the love given to them. David's words here are not only a reminder of his his decisions, they're an invitation for us to yield as God invades and transforms our hearts and he brings light to our minds and all the benefits of the gospel available within the glory of God. And and understand this, because after David writes Psalms 119, part of what, and I said this at the very beginning of this series uh, in Psalms 119, is that 
children were forced to learn this from letter to letter, eight verse by eight verse, all the way to the end. Jewish children could recite the whole thing. And they would understand that David is, is giving this invitation for us to yield and, and allow and, and move out of the way as God invades and transforms us. So let us look upon Christ's redeeming love, the gospel that's set before us, and let our hearts be marked by all that he has done. Next section. Okay, everybody still awake? Okay, we, we got a few. It's our, most of you are still here. That's great, so good. I thought it was going to be much worse than that. Verse 49 through 56. Verse 49 says this. Remember your word to your servant in which you have made me hope. This is my comfort and my affliction that your promise gives me life. The insolent utter, utterly de deride me, but I do not turn away from your law. When I think of your rules from, old, from of old, I take comfort, O Lord. Verse 53. Hot indignation seizes me because of the wicked who forsake your law. Your statutes have been my songs in the house of my sojourning. I remember your name in the night. O Lord. And keep your law. This blessing has fallen to me. That I have kept your precepts. So in this final section we're going to cover today. Hope can be described as an assurance of deliverance. I, I need to say this again. Hope is described as an assurance of deliverance. I, I want you to understand something. When, when something traumatic happens to us. And I don't care who you are. Everybody does this. You might not even know that you do this. But when something bad happens to you in a moment, there is a question you ask yourself and you quickly answer probably this quick. You don't even know that you ask yourself the question. But when calamity comes, when life gets out of control, we sometimes don't even know that we ask the question. But we act out the answer in our habits. When something crazy happens, we ask and answer a question, something like this. Where do I turn in times of trouble? When something happens, what do I do? And we may ask it simply as, what, what are we going to do with this hopeless feeling? And, and you may ask the question out loud, you may know that there's a problem and you already have your answer. Some of you are like, Dave, I don't ask that question. Ever. But here's the thing is, whether you ask it or not, you answer it. In my past, I've known people who drink when life gets difficult. I, I used to work at a Cracker Barrel back when you could smoke. I was a waiter. And all the ladies had a stressful day, man. They're in the break room just going... You couldn't even walk in there. It was like a cloud of fog and Cracker Barrel ladies with aprons. And, but their go-to and stress hit, they would smoke. And I'm not just here to harp on drugs. There's more to it than that. There's good things that happen. Some will call a certain friend. Man, things are bad. I need to call my mom. I need to call my dad. I need to call a friend of mine. Or, or I, I need to call someone in my family. I call my pastor or even a fellow believer. Sometimes our answers to these questions uh, are, are not bad. But David gives us his answer to the question. And it's this. David has learned to lean on the promises contained within the word of God. Hope is the outcome for the person who depends on God for life. That in the midst of his trouble and, and pain and trial, he remembers. And what we, we see in this psalm is he's going back to the promises of God. We trust God for the timing and, and the method in this. This assurance of deliverance. And, and what David models here is this faithfulness within the circumstance itself. And, and what happens is we usually have a go-to neural pathway we walk through when times get difficult. We get reactionary. 
But David has so attuned himself to the word of God that his reaction is the word. He understands the promise. It is the hardest part for almost all of us. It was difficult for David. He didn't always do it right. And despite his circumstance, David says to God, your promise gives me life. It's beautiful. David can only find life in God's promise, not what's going on around him. This is testing ground for us. The word is more valuable to us in trials if we look to it. It plays a greater role. Our prayers mean more to us in our trials typically. Man, we, we can pray when times are good, but man, when times are bad, we really pray. Oh, Lord. Right? Isn't that what we do? We pray differently when we're in the middle of a trial. And I get it. Please do it. These promises, promises they should mean more to us, especially in trials. Not just that we pray harder or more often, but that we rest in the promises that we have. And as we, what happens is, is when we're young in our faith, we don't know all these promises, so we, we, we pray for God to intervene, but because we don't necessarily embrace all the promises that He gives us, we wonder if He will. But man, the more that you understand, the more you embrace this word, the Holy Spirit guiding us, our Lord leading us, as we obey Him in trials, as we cling to His word in trials, we mature, we grow. Promise becomes a place of rest in the midst of storms. I want to say it again. Promise becomes a place of rest in the midst of storms. Please hear me on this. If you're struggling in your marriage, promise is a place of rest in the midst of storms. If work is driving you crazy, promise is the place of rest in the midst of storms. If you're sick, promise is the place of rest in the midst of storms. And, and, and like I said, your trials are, on, are a test. Because those who are in trials reveal the true narrative written upon their hearts. At our low points, we often say things like this, that, man, I'm hopelessly lost. I'm just a screw up. No one loves me. I'm hideous. I'm worthless. I'm alone. None of those things are true. But these are the things that we say to ourselves even though God is right there with us, even though we were made in his image, we lie to ourselves very often in the midst of difficulty. Not because we're bad people, but because we don't believe it. We don't understand. But when you do, promise becomes a place of rest. It becomes a place of rest in both good and bad times. And those who are in trials reveal the true nature written upon their hearts and our low points. I'll get to that in just one second. We often say all of this to ourselves. But those who understand David here understand that he is resting on God's promises and so should we. The narrative we write upon our hearts should be branded by the word in our hands. So look, when I talk with people one-on-one, -on -one, I usually have to get them to believe that there are lies that they've told themselves that have nothing to do with the Word of God and nothing to do with God's intention for their lives. And that is probably the hardest part of getting someone to believe. But if I can get someone to believe that, if I can get them to believe the Word in their hands about themselves, they change. Every time. Every time. When the word is solidified in trials within us, it is then that we find this unshakable faith. I want it today to be practical because David is giving us instruction in what he's telling us. The Spirit of God guides us into all truth, as Scripture states, 
and the narrative upon our hearts will then become his word if we allow it. Verse 53, it's a message to the people of God. David is not mad at Gentiles for being Gentiles in the Old Testament. He's not mad at the godless for being godless. He's enraged because of the conduct of his people. There should be a burden from all of us today for God's church. David trembles at the dishonor done to God by others in his camp, in his country. These are the people who are supposed to honor God and follow him, yet they have let sin into their camp. They have turned away from their covenant with God. And David, in this one verse here, he's he's enraged. And today we should weep and pray for the church. And as much as David is concerned of those who have forsaken the law, we should be more concerned for those who have forsaken Christ. We must have a burden. We must be concerned. I want to be clear here. The goal is not to become heresy hunters. I have found things in modern Christianity that I still don't completely agree with. But they are still somehow... There are people that believe these different ways in me that they're still somehow seeking God. Can I be real here? Many of you in this room are very mature. But I promise you, on the day when we see Christ face to face, he's going to correct all of our theology. All of us. Man, if if you go on Facebook and say, I've got it all together, look out. The day's going to come when God says, you know what? Dave, you know that thing that you thought you believed? Let me show you the truth. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. God is going to correct our theology when we see him. However, when somebody purposefully maligns the word, maligns Christ and his gospel, it is time to stand for it. It is not a time to remain silent. There are non-negotiables in the faith that we do not compromise on, that we do not stay silent when these tenets are challenged. David sees his country in covenant with God, and at the same time, they're disregarding God. And he will not remain silent. We should have that passion for Christ's church. But ultimately, I I believe we must be cautious in judgment. I think the two most dangerous places to be are to be silent when we should speak and to judge where God is not judging. Both of these are, are horrible things. I don't want to face God and he was doing something and I just didn't like it. I would hate to have that conversation. I never want to face God where I had a negative opinion of what he was doing. The Pharisees did exactly that when Jesus came. They thought they were following God. God was among them, and yet the Pharisees were unknowingly judging God's son. The people who were most likely to get this wrong were those who considered themselves followers of God when we look at the Pharisees. Why are you healing on the Sabbath, they would say. Why would all these different things happen? If I could put this in the most southern terms possible, judgment should be our fire alarm, not our squirt bottle. It's as good as I can get. If you don't get it from there, you might be from the north. That's okay. Judgment should be our fire alarm, not our squirt bottle. Let's continue. There are greater fruits we are to bear in our lives than what we judge. There are greater fruits to bear. David draws this letter of Psalm 119, this Hebrew letter, to a wonderful close, and this is a reminder for us all. This has been a matter of the heart for David. The word of God has become his song. What he passionately sings into the night is the light of life. Have you noticed, by large, culture sings of incredibly horrible things these days? Oh my gosh. But David recognized the world for what it is. Night. Darkness. And this beautiful picture of David singing God's word into the night. That should be a picture for all of us. And there's a commitment to be had here. 
But it's not some sort of religious obligation that you're supposed to have. This is not some mandate for you. We should, what David shows us here, he is so in love with God that he can't help but do these things and say these things and sing these things. You see, there's a tremendous difference between those who forsake God and those who take such pleasure in Him that they sing. But we must remember a simple truth, especially as people living in darkness. What is pleasing to those who are saved is an offense to those who are lost. We see this even in John 3. The darkness has, has no regard for the light. No regard for the light. If you are a believer, you may have the light within you, but unless you are surrounded by other believers, you do not have the light around you. Right? We don't see that until the end of Revelation when God comes and his light is visible. According to Scripture now, we walk in darkness. And that's why Jesus says, you're the light of the world. You're the city on a hill. He says that for a reason. Listen to how Paul, Paul describes the world spiritually. He says this, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. When Jesus comes to earth, Scripture describes the world as people dwelling in darkness seeing a great light. And this should be a constant reminder to us. David is a sojourner. This word, it's, it's like being a pilgrim. This idea is further expressed in Hebrews. 11, 15 through 16 says this, if they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desired a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. They're not living for here. They're living for there. They are pilgrims in this world. We are pilgrims in this world, understanding that something much better is coming. And we rest in that promise. The darkness all around us should remind us that this place is not our home. Yet so many seem to be trying to make a home here. Sometimes our hearts look like what's happened here matters more than the destination that we're walking towards. Sometimes we take our problems and we make them bigger than our faith. Sometimes we take our problems and we make them bigger than the promise. And I get it. Man, sometimes our problems are really difficult. I get it. I'm, I'm not sitting here and, and acting like, come on, don't you understand? I get it. I have had seasons in my life where I felt like my pain was bigger than my faith. I just needed more faith. And, and I needed it to cry out to God more. And we are all walking this journey. And right now, in this season, he has us walking together. We are pilgrims in a foreign country, marching towards a city that God has prepared for us. It is not a city of darkness. It is a city of light. To the point where, at the end of Revelation, it says there will never be light. I'm mean, sorry, there will never be darkness in the city of light because God's presence will never depart from there. It will always be light. So to bring this all together, these two Hebrew words that we've covered today in Psalms 119, they're marked by deliverance. And the person who understands the enormity of what God has done can only respond in tremendous gratitude. The culmination of everything I've said to you today is the idea that we should walk as people who are delivered. We should walk as people who are delivered. From the, pers from the perspective of God, what is, what is now being accomplished is actually already accomplished. We're just living it out in time. The reason why we have prophecy in Scripture, future events, God's already there. He's not waiting for, for what's happening in time. He already sees it. The reason we can read a, f a future events in the Bible is because God already knows he knows the outcome of all of our situations. We're not waiting for God to move, but outside of time, 
He has moved. We will be delivered. And I will give you three general categories, but you could easily come up with more when it comes to this idea of deliverance. That there's deliverance for our, from ourselves, that our sins are forgiven. If we would go before God repentant, we are resting in a redemption that is accomplished. We have been delivered. If we go to God and what has already been accomplished, the cross is enough to save you and me even to this very day and and to every day ahead of us. Secondly, whoops, I need to go back. Uh, Delivered from our trials. Some of you are like, Dave, I'm still facing so many things. How can you tell me that I've been delivered? I would tell you this. The ultimate outcome of your trials in life have been set by the cross. There is no contest. If you're lonely now, if you're broken now, you know the outcome because death is defeated. Life is given. And what happens is when our problems get so big, we live in the moment. We live in the moment, even if that moment cripples us. I've told this story before, but I, it was a time before I met Michelle. And, and I was in the darkest part of my depression. And I'll never forget. Have you ever? I was half awake in the morning. And I was sitting there. I was unaware of my situation. The brain, you know, the, you know, the, 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 there's lights, but they're not on. You know what I'm talking about in my head. Um, I'm sitting there. And then I finally became awake enough to where I felt like someone took about like a 225-pound barbell and just pushed down on my chest because I had become so awake that I finally realized what I was going through. But I had this for a moment, probably less than 30 seconds, of this is what it's not like. This is what it feels like not to be broken. And then when I finally came aware, I I wasn't breathing the same. I was so hurting. And we can get lost in the moment and we can forget what's been done, done for us. And I spent about a year in this. I'll never forget it as long as I live, that feeling that morning of the difference. I've been delivered. And I believe with all my heart that God will deliver you too. What has been done for you will outlast what you are facing. Sickness, poverty, difficulty, problems. Even if your life is on the line, God's promises will outlast your trials. And then finally, we've been delivered from darkness. We are pilgrims in a dark world. We were designed to pass through. We age. The road traveled here will come to an end. We were never meant to make our home here. When when your journey here is done, you will go from darkness to light, death to life, from time to eternity. And I say all of this because there is power in facing the present through promise. There is power in facing the present through promise. That when we look at our lives, does the moment dictate our hope or are the hopes we possess rooted in the promises of God? And if we can back up and understand that God's glory has saved us to the uttermost, our lives become instruments for His glory. People who have confidence in what they have been delivered from, what's been given to them, They are the ones that live passionately and intentionally for Jesus. Death is defeated. Life is established. The kingdom has come. This is a promise for today, not just for eternity. We walk in victory because Christ has overcome the grave. No matter how dark your life may be right now. And this is the picture of what David is telling us in these verses that we've read today. Christ has already won. We fix our eyes and our lives upon him, living in the victory that we will see. 
and is already accomplished for all who put their faith in Jesus. Oftentimes what happens is Christians will talk about victory. And we'll go, man, I don't feel that victorious right now. Right? I get it. But if we are people of promise, victory makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense. And my prayer today, no matter what you are facing, that you would be encouraged with these words. Amen? Let's pray. God, I, I pray right now, Lord, that you would reach into the lives of people in, in a special way, that they would feel your peace, feel your presence. God, I pray that we would be people of the word, people who are always looking back to it, trusting in your word, the words that have come from your mouth and from those that you have appointed to write. God, that we would be people of promise, that we would understand your promises, and that even in a moment, if we don't feel the victory, that promise is the pointer to what victory really is. Lord, your word says they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. As we are breathing, there is a, there is a war to rage and a fight to be had. But God, I am grateful that we have been delivered. Lord, I thank you for this day and I thank you for the people here. Lord, let us soak in your word. Let us soak in your promises. God, let us live by them, through them, and for you. God, to you be the glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's take about two minutes and let's prepare our hearts for communion. Thank you for staying awake mostly, right? <laughs> This time you're dismissed for communion. Thank you. night that Jesus was to be betrayed, he took bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it. 
said, this is my body broken for you. As often as you eat of it, do this in remembrance of me. Let's take it together. And then he took the cup. He said, this is the blood of my covenant poured out for you. As often as you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. Let's take it together. Will you stand with us?
kingdom of priests, let's declare this together. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Have a wonderful weekend.